Chief Aaron Gibbons from the City of Martinsburg Police Department. Chief, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Uh, Dylan, can you, uh, you, you got your ears on okay? Uh, here there I am. Are. There you go. How are you doing? Excellent. Okay. Good. So let's let's take you back to Friday night. The press release said 657. Chief, a shooting near uh, the stadium at Martinsburg, not inside the stadium, but outside the stadium. Can you take it from there from what you know right now? So what we have right now, and, and uh, you know, it'd be silly of me to discuss, you know, suspects, motives, um, but this was a very active um, and very, uh, I mean, heart-wrenching situation and very well could have been a very heart-wrenching situation had it been a little closer to home. Um, now, nobody expects a, a, a round from a gun to go into a football stadium. So when we initially get the call just before 7 p.m. on Friday night, we knew that the top, the number one team in the state, as well as the number two team in the state were playing. And there were a lot of people in the stadium. So when we get a call that there was a, there were shots fired near that game, of course we went into 100% as we always would. Um, but we didn't really have the, uh, we didn't ha really have the knowledge of how this had actually happened. We did know at the time that somebody in the stadium had been struck by a round. Uh, so our officers that were actually in the stadium itself rushed up through the stands. They're starting to gather information, uh, come to find out. And I started getting videos on my phone of the actual national anthem at the football game. So this happened during the national anthem at the football game. And uh, so everybody was standing and there really wasn't much of a um, response out of the crowd. Uh, I know that the individual that um, w that did get struck by a portion of a round um, did walk down to the ambulance and notify medics at that point, and at that point they notified us. Um, there was a disturbance, and people were pointing over towards Berry Street and Virginia Avenue that something had happened over in that location. So that's where, when I got the call, that's where I responded to as well as the detectives and the rest of uh, patrol. Um, we do know that there was some sort of altercation over in the area of Virginia, Berry Avenue, uh, that uh, that area. And, and where are those streets in conjunction um, with the they're stadium? They're about two, uh, I'd say it's a couple hundred yards behind the stadium. Press box side? Yes, press box side. Um, so it's just west of the stadium. Um, we do know that there was some sort of altercation. There was some exchange of gunfire. And during that exchange of gunfire, one round went up over Raleigh Street went up over, there's a large field just west of the press box, went up over the field. We believe that that round um, struck um, some kind of obstruction, whether it was a girder on the press box or a handrail, fragmented, and then that's when the shrapnel actually went into, um, there were actually three individuals that were affected by that round, by that one round. Um, now, <clears throat> again, we're showing up on scene, so we don't know if this was a very intentional uh, if the stadium was very intentionally targeted. So I can't say how important it was to for our officers to start going door to door and start getting some witness testimony, some witness statements saying, hey, we saw this, we saw this. Very quickly it started developing that the, the stadium was not targeted. However, there is still somebody out here with a gun, possibly two individuals with a gun. And what do we do with the people in the stands. Did the first notification come in as a 911 call from outside the stadium or was the first notification from police officer who reported I believe that the, the first call that came in, actually the first call that came in was a uh, prior law enforcement officer. From what I noticed on the CAD, on the CAD sheet, actually came in from a prior law enforcement officer who had heard gunshots and saw some sort of disturbance over, it wasn't from somebody that was up in the stands. It was somebody that saw or heard something over in the area of Barry and uh, Raleigh or Barry and Virginia Avenue. And then keep going from there. Chief. And so, <clears throat> um, so we had, uh, well, where was I? You were going door to door and determined that it was not an intentional targeting. Yeah. So the, so we had to make a decision what to do with the football game. And it wasn't a very hard decision because we knew somebody was still running around with a gun. Um, the decision was made to keep everybody in the stadium. Now, whether the administrative staff decided to keep playing the game or not, um, that's completely up to them. The, my biggest concern was having 
three, 400 kids exit the field and now walking around while I have canines running around, we have drones out, we have the task force, the ATF showing up. Um, so it was the information that we received from the community was crucial in establishing that one, the stadium was not a target and two, we still had somebody running around with a gun. So what could we do? Let's keep everybody in that, in that field. They do what they're going to do inside the field. We don't think that we really did not believe at that time that the stadium would have been targeted again for anything. Um, and this was more of a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, situation or crime two through two, 250 yards away. So, so, so I still stand by that decision of uh, keeping everybody in the, in the stadium. Uh, I know that at one point, you know, we didn't want somebody coming into the stadium. So we said at least just close the, the gates just for a little bit, just so that we don't have anybody coming in and out. You don't want your, your active shooter then exactly. going into the stadium exactly. and blending in and who knows what else. I think somehow that, that gate, um, eventually uh, they opened up the gate. They don't want to restrict too many people i guess martinsburg was started blowing them out of the water so dylan you did you see you you became aware sort of late in the game right so that you didn't notice a ripple of panic or anything that was going on at the time i i didn't but that being said from my position up in the press box second level of the press box also uh, i can't really see the crowd from my position unless i actively try to like look over down into the stands i'm and of course, this happened, you know, two minutes before. I mean, while we're in our basically our last commercial break to come back from the game, and I'm, you know, focused in on the football game anyway. So it didn't create at least enough of a disturbance for for me to notice. Yeah, and and like I said, I did get a couple of videos because everybody's just pouring information to us as much as possible. And from somebody just in the stands, you know, you see all these little video clips, and you you hear the national anthem. And when the gunshots do ring out, you hear a couple go off just initially, but it's in such a distance and that national anthem's playing that people, you see people kind of just kind of turn their head. Did I hear what I think I heard? Sure. Is that fireworks? Why would fireworks be during the national anthem? So do you know how many shots total were fired? Um, I couldn't say, I couldn't say total. I can, t I mean, and I wouldn't really tell you right now how many rounds we'd actually found because then i get locked into that one but mm -hmm. we, we had our cameraman up on the roof say that he was able to hear something during the anthem but you know, i i wasn't personally able to inside of the press box so dylan you were that was pretty close to home for you as well yeah i guess yeah i guess so. yeah. matt miller so uh, again there seemed to be a shootout so are we talking there were two separate weapons possibly involved this was not just one person shooting yeah i believe that there were two mm -hmm. um two different uh, firearms involved in this incident. And how, I hate to use the word lucky, but I mean, how lucky are we in this situation? Because the way I hear you describe it as that one round heads towards the stadium, apparently accidentally, just a part of the shot, you said it hit and then fractured. If that doesn't hit something and fracture into pieces, but rather hit someone, that could have been a lot more serious. It, you know, there's all kinds of determining factors in how serious this really could have been. Um, just for the simple fact, if they were standing instead of sitting mm. or sitting instead of standing, right. it might have hit in a completely different spot. And there was one person in the press release it was not hit by shrapnel. It said one person was actually hit by a bullet. Uh, yes, at least a large portion of the bullet, and it lodged just underneath the skin. So at that distance, that trajectory, you know, it's slowing down as it, as it gets to the stadium, but also hitting something so we're 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 lucky in all accounts um but like i said everybody's um the victims cooperated and and honestly other than the victims nobody really wants to get a resolve or a resolution out of this case more than i do because it's our guys out there working this case and i mm -hmm. love to love to get these things solved so Chief, this is very active um the person who struck by a bullet i can understand you're struck by a bullet, you're, I got shot. The people that were hit by shrapnel, were they all aware of the fact that they had been hit by a fragment of a bullet or that they had sustained any type of injury? Yes, the the one subject immediately went down and I think the other two that just had superficial, almost almost uh, very first layer skin type things, um, 
eventually over the next several minutes, they had come down out of the stands as well, especially when our officers immediately ran up into the stands to see what's going on. How many officers did you have present <clears throat> at the game? Uh, I believe we had five present at the game, but then we also had a lot of rovers. So a lot of ro rovers roving around the stadium or at least in the area of the stadium. So. And then after the call went out that there were shots, how many additional police officers ended up doing the canvassing? Uh, every, every one that we could, we had, I mean, we have, uh, the Eastern Panhandle Drug and Violence Crimes Task Force at our disposal. So that has representatives of the FBI, the, the, uh, Martinsburg Police Department, the Sheriff's Office, State Police. Um, I called, uh, Jeanette with the ATF. She came out, she was there in about five, 10 minutes to help us collect these rounds. Um, and then, then to start getting those, uh, processed. Uh, we have Berkeley County Sheriff's Office showed up. You know, their office is just down the street, so we had plenty of them show up initially. Um, and then, of course, our officers. And when something like that happens, especially when it's near a school, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're at, you're getting there. You'll have people from, not saying that we had anybody from Virginia or Maryland show up, but usually when you have something that close to home or involving kids, everybody shows up. Did you have state police involvement? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't. When I got there, it was about 10, 15 minutes after the call. Um, I didn't see any state police on scene. Uh, but that doesn't say that doesn't mean that they weren't in the area helping us canvas. Were there any bullets that struck houses nearby? We checked all of the uh, um, surrounding houses. We looked through, you know, all of the sheds along the alleyways. There's two alleyways that run between Virginia and Raleigh Street um, along Barry. Uh, there's two alleyways, so we didn't see any um, damage to any buildings or sheds or trees that I know of. Um, not to say that one didn't get lodged into a tree or into the ground close to a curb or something like that. So, How late did you actively work the area searching for more evidence and the suspects? Well, I finally went back to station to um, chalk up that uh, press release. I don't know, it was probably around 11, 12 o'clock, and then I came back in. I went back out there and probably till myself till about 1, one thirty, maybe just running around looking for stuff. Um, but the rest of the guys, they are, they, they pretty much take, it's not that they really take shifts, but if they're awake, they're working the call. So if they have to, you know, take certain shifts and go home to get four or five hours of sleep, sleep, then they'll do that and then just come right back and they're right back into the into this um, work in this investigation. So they, they won't stop working this investigation. Does an investigation like this get assigned to one or two officers, investigators, and they stay on it or does it become an entire department? They usually stay on it. <clears throat> now, it, it does become a departmental investigation. Anybody, I mean, we have people uh, from different shifts who will get leads here and there and they'll just start working those leads and they wind up, they weren't even associated with this investigation. And before you know it, you have 10, 12 officers that are going to be involved in this, uh, in this case when it comes to testimony. So. And, and what is the status of the investigation currently? Are you close? Do you have any suspects? It's very, um, it's still very active. Like I said, it's, it'd be very silly for me to discuss motive or suspects at this, at this time. But I assure you here in the next few days, you know, if I come on here Friday or Monday, we'll have a lot of answers that, you know, I can sit here and discuss with you about, and you'll say, ah, that's why he didn't say anything. So it's you know, I, very active. Like I said, we have, we have the state police, we have, um, the F FBI is involved in this, um, with the task force. We have, uh, the ATF, Berkeley County Sheriff's office, anybody who gets any little bit of information, um, for this case, right to our detectives. And they're, they're constantly working this. I'm, I'm convinced the decision not to evacuate the stadium saved a lot of lives, not because of active shooters on the street, but a panic in a stadium environment, just people getting crushed and stuff. So kudos on that. I am curious, though, how do you end up working a crime scene where three people have been shot, have been injured, and not trigger some kind of, of panic, for lack of a better term? Because, you, right, you've got, a, you've got bullet fragments that you're picking up and, and people that are injured, and they're families and such that are around there. How do you control that and not have that rumor spread in a, in like wildfire? Well, I mean, I think it's all, you know, situational dependent, you know, if we had had an entire section of the bleachers freak out and start running through the field, that would have been a completely different situation to where we would have had to spend more time and resources in controlling 
that panic in the field rather than, and then we're dividing forces and we're splitting time between the field and the crime scene itself. So very fortunately, you know, everybody in the stands, all the, you know, everybody that was in attendance in this game um, acted very well, even if they had known about this shooting. Um, uh, I give them kudos for um, maintaining their, their um, candor while this is happening. Um, I appreciate people not freaking out, but most importantly, I really appreciate the fact that they trusted what we were doing, whether it was on the field or out here behind them on Virginia Avenue or on a uh, Raleigh street, because a lot of them did know that something, it only took, you know, 20, 30 minutes for those lights to go down. And here you have all those police lights right mm -hmm. there behind the stadium. So everybody was very, um, very respectful. Um, nobody got out of control. Um, and like I said, it's situational dependence. So it could have gone a different direction. Had it gone a different direction where you have an entire section of the stands freak out, then we would have had handled that as it, as it would have developed. So speaking of going a different direction, you've been in law enforcement here in Martinsburg for many years How, with all the growth and the things that are going on, the I-81 corridor, the traffic, um, how are you seeing things like this, uh, kind of more serious crime, if you will, uh, kind of creeping its way into our area? And it's, you know, we've discussed this before, and it's very, um, it, it comes and goes, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, five, six years ago, you had a big rash of violence. And then it'll go into, um, it'll go everything from violence to property theft and then into overdoses and so it's ever changing it always has and it always will be it's just getting one staffing plays a huge port, uh, part in this so whether it's the sheriff's department state police or myself the the martinsburg police department getting up to staff so that we can get out there and get active on these uh crimes uh that that really plays a huge part in our response to what's happening around us as far as violence goes. Um, but I would say that getting up to staff, and we are getting up to staff, Berkeley County Sheriff's Office is getting up to staff. We're, we're about uh, six down right now, and we were at 18 at this time last year. Um, so we've really made some great strides to get back up to staff, but again, that's getting people out there on the street, getting them working these special details so that they can actually get out and start talking to people and find and interrupt this criminal activity. How much does the community policing help in, in situations like this? I know that that was a big push under, under Maury when he was here as the, the, the chief and, and, you know, making sure that you had bicycles, you had officers walking the streets and getting to meet and know people so that in a situation like this, there's a trust factor that's already there. And those folks, when you're knocking on the door, are ready to go, yeah, here's what I saw or heard. And it's changing that mentality as well. You know, having these officers, the community, to actually specifically seek out an officer that they trust. That that's huge to even the officer, and they and they take that to heart. So I think that plays a big a big part. You know, community policing, but it also has its place. You know, you have to be actively engaging in criminal activity, but you also have to get that that trust from the community so that they will talk to you about what's happening in their community. So it's, it's an ever changing piece of the puzzle that, um, that I'm, I'm all for, but I'm also in for getting out here and, and, uh, getting these drug details, these crime details, these, um, hard crime details, or just a hotspots detail where you're specifically focusing on areas of concerns from the community. And that's one thing that I really, push to the community is this isn't just a, a police issue, a law enforcement issue. This is an entire community issue. You know, we have a very close knit and a, a very warm hearted community and we have to work develop we have to work together to develop that piece of safety um, throughout the community. So it's any information that anybody has on on um, just everybody needs to stay very vigilant. They need to trust in what we are doing out here on the street. I know that everybody wants to know and hear and see everything that we're doing out here on the street. And to a point we can do that, but they really need to trust and see what we're actually doing. So when you see a, resp a response from law enforcement, whether it's here or a shooting over on Burke Street or you know something that happens in Spring Mills, so that we 
they understand that they can trust us to do our jobs, what we're supposed to be doing. Dylan, did you have a question for Chief Gibbons? Uh, none that I can think of. I just wanted to make sure before we wrapped up our segment here uh, with the Chief. John, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, just real quick. I don't know how much time we have. If Three a, minutes. A, a situation like this is a mass casualty incident that didn't happen, so there's an opportunity to kind of test the plans. Were there lessons learned out of this, changes that you don't have to go into them, but did, did you get to stress test the plans and learn some lessons for things to change? Definitely a stress test. So you you see the response, whether it's it has to do with the participants in the, in the stadium or the visitors, um, where the buses are parked compared to where they shouldn't be parked. You know, any situation like this, and thank goodness it was as, I don't, I don't want to, you know, minimize this, this, this call or this uh, – yeah, I don't want to minimize this call, but we're very fortunate that it turned out the way that it had, and the circumstances behind this were as they were. Um, had this have been a different situation or a more active situation targeting that, that school, then the response would have been completely different, I assure you. But there are little lessons to learn, mm -hmm. you know, everything from where certain vehicles are parked and where they can park to okay, how many of these kids have backpacks on? And I'm sure Dylan saw a lot of kids, you know, 300 mm -hmm. some middle school kids walking around with backpacks. That's that's a situation as well. But, you know, learning a lot of little, uh, a lot of little tricks that you need to get around in order, in, in case this had been a more uh, violent or well, this, targeted. Uh, change how you deploy people at football games, Chief, I mean, especially with that open field behind the stadium? And I think it I think it plays a part in well having the number one and number two team in the in that stadium that drew an extremely large crowd as well, so I think that you know the response for how many officers we actually had in the state stadium I think that was appropriate. Um, we may have some more roving patrols around the stadium while it's happening, but again, it's one of those that you kind of picked up the lessons learned, and fortunately we can we can uh, grow from there. Is there a uh Chief manual, chief's manual that you use when you get a call like this, like step one, we do this. Step two, we call this team. Step three, we do this. There is. But the most important thing is you just go, you just go and you handle this call as you always have and you always will. Um, you know, I find it hard as the, as the chief of police when I'm out here, you know, I'm the chief of police, but I'm also out there with a flashlight looking for rounds in the grass too. Mm -hmm. So you got, I mean, I'm still going to do that. We're all going to keep doing that. But um, uh, there are manuals as you would say or a certain um criteria for who you call first you know dispatch who they call first who they notify first do they are they notifying the detectives the task force the chief you know so they go down the line appreciate you coming in today i appreciate you guys having me on have a wedding cookie on the way out if you want i will do you, you have break access to cover if i could oh my goodness i just didn't want to get on the radio with chocolate <laughs> on my face chief aaron gibbons we appreciate his uh help with uh, further explanations on what happened Friday night near the stadium at Martinsburg High School.